ask you just to start by sitting with yourself and think about what emotion do you feel at the moment? Can you name it? Emotional well-being is something that we write on post-it notes and we stick on motivational posters, but it's rarely something that we actually think about. And particularly when we think about leadership training, uh, having recently completed my MBA, at no point did anyone talk about how it feels to lead and the responsibility and emotions that are attached to the responsibility of leading a team. It's very easy to focus when you're in leadership and management on delivering the product, on getting to high-performing outcomes. But we know that people leave jobs because they leave their line managers. It's the emotional connection with our work that actually leads to the highest productivity. If you have a team that connects with each other on an emotional level, you can change the world. And that's why movements make so much more difference than companies when it comes to changing society. I went on my own Christmas journey around the emotions of leadership um, during that horrible thing, the COVID pandemic, and I'm sorry to have plunged us back two years into the start of 2020. I came to Birmingham in 2019. It was my first director of public health job. My job is to protect and improve the health and well-being of the 1.2 billion citizens of Birmingham. Just a little thing. And in normal times, the health protection function of my job is dealing with measles outbreaks or talking to people about contaminated food. It's normally about 5% of what I'm responsible for. And just before Christmas in 2019, I was summoned to a call uh, by what was then Public Health England to say, there's this thing going on in Wuhan. It's a bit of China you won't have heard of. Let's just tell you about what's going on. We're just watching. And we wanted you to be aware. And then we came back to work after Christmas and the new year, and gradually those urgent calls that went in my diary from the chief medical officer got more frequent. And then one day my mobile phone rang, and it was the regional director from the Department of Health, and she said, you have your first case in Birmingham. Three days later, she rang again to say, you have your first death. And over the following weeks, the city rapidly was plunged into the pandemic. And the conversation that I had at the start of the pandemic with the chief medical officer was, um, given where Birmingham is, you know, we're a globally diverse city. It's one of the best cities, I think, in the world. You can eat food from all over the world and you don't really need to get in an Uber to get that. You can walk it in this city. Um, However, we have real challenges. We're also a city in which boys born in our poorest areas die 10 years earlier than boys born in our richest area. And we have high levels of chronic disease, lung disease, heart disease, and cancer. All of those things meant that when the chief medical officer rang me and said, this is what is going to happen, he said, prepare yourself for 9,000 people to die in Birmingham in the first wave. That is what the modelling says. On an average year, we lose 3,000 people in this city. And as I started to experience the pandemic, I'm a doctor, so I put on my mental white coat. I went into this like I would rush into a recess room, like you see on casualty. And my job was to be calm and in control and to navigate the space, whatever I saw and to manage my emotions accordingly. So that's what I did coming into the pandemic. And the first week of Easter in 2020, we hit almost 200 deaths in the week. Now I chose to read every death certificate of everyone that died in the city in the first wave of COVID. I wanted to honor their names. What I hadn't really thought about was the emotion that that would bring. And I remember very distinctly standing on the balcony of my flat, looking out over the city at the nice flat with a nice view, but looking out over Birmingham and thinking, 
I can't save this patient. This is not a resus call where I've got any chance of saving the city. I'm no longer running a cardiac arrest. I'm now captaining the Titanic. And my job now is to shout instructions on how to swim and to chuck anything that floats in the water and give the city the absolute best chance that I can. And you can hear in my voice how the emotion comes back to me of that moment of realization that my leadership had to change and that the emotional aspect of my leadership needed to change as well. I needed to understand and deal with these emotions because shifting from saving everyone to sacrificing some was a really difficult emotional space for me to be in. And the reason I share that is because it's important to think about what our emotions are there for. You know, what makes us human beings? What makes us animals? These emotions. You know, even as babies, we react with emotion. Cats, dogs, anyone who has any pets will know that they're emotional creatures. Cats are generally selfish, push things off things. Dogs are generally lovable, cute, and not particularly moody. You can tell I'm a dog person. Um, <laughs> you know, it is what makes us different from being inanimate objects. And emotions are there to tell us. They give us warning signs. They prompt us to do things that we enjoy, that, that are good for us. They also help warn us when things are bad. So cutting ourselves off from the emotional aspects of our leadership is illogical. They're there for a reason. They're there to help us. And there is a whole load of theory. I share this not to take you through an academic flowchart of how emotions are formed and how they play out in the workplace, but simply to say, this isn't a new idea. It's not quite as old as Aztec ice um, towns, but it is something that's been around since the 1980s. Yet when we teach leadership in MBA courses and undergraduate business degrees, we teach great man theory. We teach people about transformational leadership. We do not talk about the emotions of leadership. And I think that's to our detriment. It's not because we don't have the evidence base. It's because we choose not to go into this difficult and uncomfortable space. But we need to go into this difficult and uncomfortable space. And we need to go into it now more than ever. The fact that we all have mobile phones attached to our hips that are continually fighting for our attention with something that's new and bright and colorful is meaning that we are forgetting how to connect with other people. It's so easy to send my mother a text message rather than have a conversation because I can choose to edit out the emotion. Text doesn't convey emotion in the way that the spoken voice does. If you read about my experiences with COVID, you would intellectually process them, but I doubt they would touch your heart. And I doubt you would resonate with the emotions in my voice simply by reading my words. One of the challenges in this space is therefore that we can disconnect from our emotions. We can hide behind the technology. How many of you have asked a colleague how they are and the response has been, I'm fine? And you know damn well they're not fine. You can see it. But we're very British about emotions. If I'm having a really terrible day and my boss asks me how my, I am, I will say, I'm tired. Just a little tired today. Unfortunately, I've been very sick during my life and I have been in a situation where I've been communicating in a resuscitation room as a patient, using the computer to talk to me. And someone said, how are you? And I've typed, I'm tired. I'm on a machine that's breathing for me and I'm saying I'm tired because I don't have the emotional vocabulary to articulate that I'm scared, that I'm terrified that I'm overwhelmed. We don't use words about emotions as much as we should and we could. Yet when we look at children, we want them to tell us when they're happy. 
Any of you who've got toddlers will know the joy when a child starts to vocalise words instead of crying, shouting, screaming, biting, kicking, all of those things that little things don't do. The moment they can speak, they can communicate what they want. And the emotions are a really important part of that. But somewhere through growing up, we start to forget to talk about emotions. And we start to slip into a language that denies their existence. And the challenge with that is that many of us in this world of hyperstimulation are operating on batteries which are running very, very low. That we're ignoring our emotions. And because we're ignoring them or we're bottling them up inside, they're gradually just burning through that battery. And we're getting ever, ever closer to burnout. And when we respond to burnout and the emotional challenge of leadership, it's really hard to do at an organisational level. You know, in the council at the moment, I've just completed some work looking at burnout risk in our senior leadership teams. And it's high. It's not surprising it's high. Um, you know, Birmingham is going through a really challenging time. But then I stepped back and went, well, so what can the organisation do? And yes, there are things the organisation can do, but the reality is it's quite hard to help individuals manage their emotional resilience, manage their well-being at an organisational level. I can tell you till I'm blue in the face to eat healthy, go to sleep, stand up, move about. I can structure your rotor to help and enable it. But unless you choose to do it, I can't do anything about it. So this cartoon really spoke to me because too many organisations have not quite struck smoke detectors to people's heads. But it's quite often I've worked with businesses where the answer to this has been, I'm going to put on some yoga classes. Well, you can't yoga your way out of bad management. You can't yoga your way out of denying the emotions of leadership. It doesn't work like that. In some ways, I wish it didn't. So I didn't want to leave you in a negative headspace. I wanted to talk about, well, OK, how do you navigate this? And this reflects very much my journey of transition during the COVID pandemic. And just to take us back there and give you a sense of my reality at that time, I was living in the city, I'd been here barely a year, my husband had moved up, was a GP locally. Fortunately, he went to clinic every day. If he hadn't, I'm not sure we'd still be married. Um, and I was working on average 17 to 18 hours a day. I was doing live question and answer sessions. Uh, I was doing British Sign Language translation sessions on Facebook Live, radio phone-ins, answering staff questions, reinterpreting national policy. Um, much as we would all like to think that government policy was issued to those of us that had to deliver it ahead of you, I found out exactly the same time. So, you know, Prime Minister's briefing was absolutely uh, sacrosanct time, and usually I would be on the radio locally about half an hour later trying to interpret it along with everyone else. So how did I cope? How did I manage during these days? Well, I would say at the beginning I didn't do it very well. Um, I didn't navigate my emotions beautifully. Uh, my team will probably tell you that you know, they certainly could see at times um, and then I reached that crux point at Easter where I realised that trying to pretend it was all okay was no longer the way to lead. So I started to talk authentically and honestly about where I was as a leader. I used to run a session once a week where all staff in the council, it's about 11,000 staff, could um, ask me questions. And the first question every time we met, and this was all virtually online, was, how are you today, Dr. Mike? And I took a conscious decision to always answer that question honestly. And most of the time it was, I'm tired. Yeah. Sometimes it was, I am quite overwhelmed by where we're at. Sometimes it was, I'm exhausted. Sometimes, rarely during the first wave of the pandemic, it was, I have hope. But I tried to talk about my emotions and use language that was real and authentic and true. 
And through that, I came to know myself. So my first tip in navigating the emotions of leadership is know yourself, look in the mirror and be honest. Find the language to explore your emotions. There are loads of kids books on this, go back to them, revisit them. Really write down what makes you happy. What does happiness feel like? In a world of consumerism, we've lost connection with what is actually important. We seem to be chasing this great mecca of happiness. The reality is if we could get to contentment, many of us would be a lot happier. But explore your emotions, explore the language of your emotions. Talk regularly and frequently with friends, with colleagues, with peers, talk about your emotions. The more we talk about them, the more other people get permission to talk about them. If you're not a talker, if you're someone who's super private, write it down. You know, I've never kept a diary, partially because I'm concerned someone would read it. Um, but if you're a diary, if you're a writer, write it down. Get those emotions out and describe them, explore them. And then finally, set boundaries. The emotional roller coaster of leadership can take you in all sorts of wonderful places, but you can also be dragged off it. So setting boundaries around yourself and your emotions is really important to navigating it and ensuring your roller coaster doesn't come off its tracks. These things all sound really simple things to say. And I would say I'm still on this journey. I haven't grown my butterfly wings despite my fabulous jacket. <laughs> but it is a journey that is worth taking. Because to move from being someone who internalizes, who hides, who cannot articulate their emotions, to a leader who is truly authentic, who truly connects with the emotions of leadership, is the type of leadership that leads real change in our society and leads to a better future for all of us. As Maya Rushley once said, people will not remember what you did for them. They will remember how you made them feel. Thank you very much.